Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain and we are on day 2374 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Each Tuesday I'll share a message I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church this year. This message is a fifth of a 22-week message series exploring 1st and 2nd Peter. Today's message is titled, Pressing On Even Though Ripped Off. I pray that it'll be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. As strong young young men were willing to carry that burden, but if they had to carry it for any length of time, I think it would get mighty heavy. I do appreciate everybody being here today. As we look into God's Word again, now last week, we learned how we, as God's chosen people, are becoming living stones. If you remember the bricks I had up here last week, the brick that I dropped last week. We are becoming living stones, but sometimes we do fall and stumble. This week, we need to understand that we, as Christ followers, will not only be recipients of unjust treatment at times, but there are benefits, actually, to bearing the brunt of those unjust treatments in a message titled, Pressing On, Even Though Ripped Off. Today's passage is 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 25. It's on page 1888 and 1889 of your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along, starting with verse 13. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom to cover up evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear to God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscience of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and you endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, it is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. And no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd, the overseers of your souls." Have you ever bought a used car and then realized a few weeks later that it was a real lemon? I have fallen prey to that. It was a Fiat. It was called a Le Car. And we had it in the shop, I think, more than we were had it running on the road. Ever drop $100 or more on the latest supplement or diet regime that was promising to make and guaranteeing that you'd be healthy, wealthy, and wise. I might have been part of that. Who hasn't been hoodwinked by some sort of smooth-talking salesman in a striped suit and puffed-up hair with patent leather shoes? And who hasn't been burned by a glitzy political ad that promised much more than was ever delivered? See, these common rip-offs They're relatively easy to recover from. It's much more difficult, though, when we have to endure personal suffering. You're in good company if you've ever been caught in some sort of raw deal and you got the brunt of that deal. Saul did this to King David. Jacob cheated his brother Esau. Joseph was brutalized by his brothers and sold into slavery. And Job got the rawest deal of all by the accuser himself. Of course, being numbered among the ranks of David, Esau, Joseph, and Job isn't that great when it means that we are treated unjustly by others. 
And things can get pretty nasty in our own lives when somebody slanders our reputation or gossips behind our back or threatens our livelihood. In my experience, our knee-jerk reaction to these unfair treatments generally fall into one of three categories. First, we may adopt the aggressive pattern of blaming others, focusing our purse on the person who did us wrong, and doing whatever it takes to exact revenge from that situation. The second is to embrace a patter, passive pattern of feeling sorry for ourselves, becoming absorbed in self-pity, and whining constantly about our plight to anybody who's willing to listen. And the third way is we may slip into a holding pattern of postponing our feelings, placing our emotions on that back burner, and just letting them seethe in what appears to be a calm surface. But underneath, it's just boiling. All these are natural reactions. They, they make sense from a human standpoint. But that's what they are. They're natural and they're human. But the Apostle Peter in our passage today offers a supernatural and divine alternative. But let me warn you. Peter's stout examples of unjust treatment probably outweigh most of anything that we've suffered in our own lives our petty grievances, and it strips off any excuse that we might have to default to these typical knee-jerk reactions. Remember, as we look at verses 13 through 17, that Peter's purpose for writing the letter is to point his readers to that were part of the churches in Asia Minor to Jesus Christ as the source of all truth and hope in hurtful times. In what hurtful times they were. We are so blessed to live in a country that we do, by divine providence, that we're given the freedoms that we have. Because those Christians were scattered and mistreated. They were imprisoned and enslaved. Family members rejected them, singled out by their employers for persecution, and they were attacked by law enforcement officials who were supposed to be protecting them. And all of them throughout the entire empire, the believers, were living under an emperor who was growingly increasingly insane, and he was an anti-Christian. That was the Emperor Nero, who just really blamed the Christians and somewhat the Jews for everything wrong in his empire. So we begin Peter's in his letter today, with a gone honoring response to unfair justice, unfair treatment. In verse 13, he says, Submit yourselves to the, for the Lord's sake to every human authority. And I appreciate John's scripture this morning that he read a different alternative from Romans, but saying basically the same thing Peter says here. But it doesn't sound strange that we're to submit to authority regardless. That sounds rather radical. Now, the word submit comes from a Greek word, hypotasis, and it's a term describing respect for another person's authority. A brutal authority might impose his will on an unwilling subject. However, Peter calls for believers to submit with a willing heart. This is hard for us in America. Our country was founded on breaking away from the British Empire. It was founded on being independent. So we really struggle with this. Submitting to human government requires that we render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. Our civil obedience is told in Matthew 22, verse 21. It involves a sincere prayer for rulers in authority over us, as 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says. And that's why we pray for our elected officials every Sunday. And I try to pray for them every day because... Scripture commands that we pray for those that are in authority over us. And that's regardless of whether we agree with their politics or their policies. I don't know that I've agreed with most politicians for the last several decades. But that doesn't prevent me or should not prevent me from praying for them. We are to live honorably and peaceably in their realm. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7, as John read. Believers are to be model citizens, not social rebels or misfits. So Peter urges his readers to recognize the higher authorities, the kings, or in our case, the president. 
and even local authorities such as the governors and mayors, regardless of their corruption and their idolatries, regardless they are existing authorities that were to, so, supposed to be respected and supported. But why? How can we do that as believers? Peter commands that we do. He gives us reason for this radical submission because in verse 15 it says, For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. The word silence here is phimu. And it means to muzzle. As 1 Timothy chapter 5.18 says, you must not muzzle the ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. But more often, the New Testament refers to this term of muzzling as a metaphorical sense to render somebody speechless because of their guilt. Matthew 22 verse 12. Or to defeat somebody in a debate. Not unlike the debates we have for our politics today, which is more just a shouting match, debates is contesting your point. And because we're living according to God's word, our lives will ex extinguish what is being said by the other party. But it even means that we submit to higher authorities, as Luke chapter 4, verse 35 mentions. Peter has in mind the metaphorical muzzling of somebody, those Christians Foolish opponents, those that are not wise according to God's word. You see, these baseless charges were flying around the churches of Asia Minor during that day. Of Peter wrote this letter about the Christians. Some of the rumors that were flying during that time were they are loyal to a different king. They're a rebellious sect. They want to overthrow the government. They are subversives by submitting voluntarily and doing what is right before God and the people, they would muzzle the mouths of those that were spreading such vicious and erroneous rumors. This is what Peter is encouraging them to do. Now, behind Peter's command to submit in verses 13 and 14, and his reasons for submitting in verse 15, stands an essential principle about our attitudes towards submission in verses 16 and 17. In today's context, we submit to the president of our country, even if we didn't vote for them or their, his party. We submit to the lawmaker's decision, even if we think that sometimes they are senseless and excessive. In short, we submit not because we're blind nationalists, but because we're God's slaves. As such, we are obligated to serve him, and to do so, we need to live in such a way that to honor his reputation in the public square. If the outside world sees us as just a vicious mob protesting everything that's out there today is not honoring to God. If you look at your bulletin insert today on the side, it says pressing on even though ripped off. I want to look over four brief commands to honor God. Because this principle comes, these four brief commands, and they're like a barrage of gunfire in rapid succession. Let me read verse 17 first, and then we'll go through it. Respect everyone and love the family of believers, fear God, and respect the king. These 14 words are easy for us to write out, but they can be a tricky balancing act. And I, didn't, I was trying to figure out how to illustrate this, and I know this is pretty small, but this is an eagle with its beak on top of this little pole, and it will balance out. And I feel this is sort of like us as believers today dealing with unjust governments Ones that are contrary to God's word, it's a tricky balancing act for us to balance properly before the world. We are to honor all people. We respect them regardless of their faith, their godless lifestyles. We don't have to agree with it. But we're to honor those people, it says, to respect those people. Or their attitudes toward Christians. They may hate Christians, but we're still to respect those people. But balancing that out on the other side is, at the same time, we must love the brotherhood of believers unconditionally. Now, if outside world sees the church conflicting inside, what is that message going out to the world? 
They can't even get along with themselves. How can they ever get along or respect us? The other half of that equation is we must have our reverence to God, our allegiance to God, treating his will as supreme in our lives. But the balancing act on that is we must respect the king, respect the president, the lawmakers. And I have to admit, I'm a patriotic American, and I struggle with that at times, showing the respect that I need to for the offices that they hold in our country. We must honor the king who may hate us, hate his people, and hate God. But Peter tells us we're still to respect that position, at least, that's in our country. Like the graphic at the bottom of the side of the page says, the good news for tough times, submission is not a dirty word. And we, at some times, in our country especially, I think, most Western nation, nations, have a hard time submitting. I know I do. And I think it's probably true of most people. But let's be realistic. The Bible never suggests that rulers will be perfect and that our civil submission is not conditional upon whether the government is modeling a Christian virtue or reflecting Christian morality. It doesn't say you only respect the king if he models Christian values. It's not what it says. Remember, in Peter's day, the empire wasn't a benevolent pro-Christian monarchy. It was quite the opposite of it. During those days, a percentage of the taxes that Christians paid supported the construction of pagan temples. It fu funded unjust wars. And don't forget, there was an insane dictator, Nero, who was notoriously cruel toward Christians. So this combination posed a dilemma for Peter and his readers. How do, does one respect everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and respect the king? Shouldn't they refuse to pay taxes that support such an oppressive regime? Or maybe they should take up arms and resist the government with such a leader as that. But Peter said no. Nowhere in scripture is revolt or anarchy promoted. It's all too common, I think, in our country today, in other countries, Western world, where they're allowed the freedom to protest. There's a difference between civil civil protest and civil disobedience. And we'll get into a little bit of that here in a second. But Peter's call to submit to an established government as a system and maintaining order doesn't mean that God endorses every ruler. He allows rulers to be in place. He appoints the kings and takes them down. But that doesn't mean he approves of all their actions. Neither does he approve of particular laws that stand in defiance against the will of God. Believers are not obligated to follow those laws that conflict with his clearly defined will, as we see in Daniel chapter 6 or Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And might be saying, well, what are you saying? You're sort of talking out both sides of your mouth. <coughs> Nor are we instructed to face and keep silent in blatant social and political injustices in our country, especially since we have the freedom to voice our opinion. But in cases where God has given his people a command, like preaching the gospel or shunning idolatry, those are things that we should do as believers, that we must obey God rather than human leaders. But in doing so, we must also be ready to suffer the legal consequences for that disobedience or that outspoken criticism. The uprisings on the college campuses over the last two to three weeks, I think is a lesson for all of us. There's one thing for peaceful protest, it's another for civil disobedience and destruction of property. And if they cross that line, they should be ready to be responsible for the acts that they committed. Now, I might not agree with those protests, but they need to be responsible for that. And if 
in our country, if it comes to a place where we have to cross that line into civil disobedience, then we must be willing to suffer the consequences of that as believers and stand why we're actually willing to stand for that. See, our responsibility to submit to human government and our response to the evil of that same government are matters that we must approach very wisely, very carefully, and very prayerfully. Neither is the answer to follow some sort of holy, uh, unholy agenda of a tyrant by waving our patriotic flags and saying, oh, I don't agree with you, but I'm going to be patriotic. That would dishonor God, the church, and the world. But we're not also to barricade ourselves behind barbed wire in a compound and wage war against a corrupt government. Those officials that come knocking on our door for tax bills or search warrants, that would dishonor the king and bring up re reproach upon Christ. But these are two extremes, and we live in a constant tension as this ego up here constantly balancing on this pedestal. The constant tension of Peter seems is an impossible command to respect everyone, but love the family believers. Fear God, but respect the king. Only God-given wisdom can help us to know how to balance with the appropriate tension that we have. Now, as we move on to verses 18 through 25, Peter shifts his focus here, still on submission to those in authority, but now it's a different situation. Leaving that more, more significant issue of submission to government authority, Peter turns to a particular example of submission that was quite common in the Roman Empire in that first century, and that's one of slavery. Now, the 21st century world, we rightly shudder at the sound of slavery as abject violation of the human rights, our fundamental human rights. Peter's words probably seem shocking here. To some, they might be downward, downright offensive to us. The institution of slavery in Peter's day was much different than the disgusting racist system in our modern history. And it's even different than the deplorable underworld slave trafficking that we see in our world today. But slavery in the ancient world still could be just as miserable, even deadly, especially for masters that didn't appreciate their slaves' newfound allegiance to Christ. Many people have drawn the analogy between today's employer-employee relationships as what Peter was talking about here in this passage. And in some ways, that's appropriate, but in more fundamental ways, the analogy breaks down very quickly. As applying the principles to this text for today in our world, the realm of employment is just barely a place to start. Still, we must never forget that the mass majority of us who are still employed in our Western world, it's voluntary and, com and not compulsory. We could quit at any time. We might not choose to because we need the income, but we could quit at any time. We're not under any compulsory to remain at a job. But let's look at what slavery was in the Roman Empire. Because it would be incorrect for us to understand slavery in Peter's day as similar to slavery in our modern world as we know it. While certainly not free, slaves in the ancient world should more be considered a social class of people. Historians believe that the total number of slaves in the Roman Empire in Peter's day was probably somewhere between 25 and 40% of the entire population were considered slaves. Before Peter's time, Roman acquired most of their slaves as spoils of war. They'd conquer a nation and take all the people of that nation, as Babylon did with Israel, into their servitude. They were slaves for them. But men and women could become slaves in several ways. Children of slaves automatically became slaves. They didn't have a choice. Abandoned children that were found could be put into slavery automatically. But people might even sell their own children or even themselves into slavery to fulfill debts and other obligations to those that they were obligated toward. And as such, slavery in the Roman world was based on more of a social class of people, economic or political status, than a race or ethnicity. We don't have a clear distinction of that in our country, but in India, they have different caste systems. <clears throat> 
and you're born into a caste, and that's your lot in life. It's hard to break out of that. You might think, of, well, the Appalachian region could be a social class of people, but it's not quite the same as what is and was in Rome. Actually, daily tasks of slaves could vary widely, depending on the skill of the person, the status of their masters, or the city or region that they happen to live in. Duties could be as men menial as you were a housekeeper or a cleaner for somebody's household and could be considered in servitude to them. Or it could, might be as brutal as in a mining colony where they were mined for gold or other precious metals. But other slaves in the Romans' day were prized cooks. They cooked for aristocracy. And that was their responsibility. But they were slaves in that. Some were teachers. And some were even physicians to royal families, but still under servitude to those masters. The treatment of slaves depended on the temperament of the masters or the mistresses. Masters could set their slaves free in Rome at their leisure. And then as a slave, that they did that, they would take on their master's name and become part of that same social class as their master. Since Roman law allowed that possibility for granting rights to slaves to be free, the composition of the slave population began to change over time, especially concerning the ethnic diversity of it. And whereas at one time only non-Romans people were slaves, by the time Peter wrote this letter, both Romans and non-Romans could be included as slaves. And throughout history, some radical Christians have interpreted the freedom that we have in Christ as warranting a social and political freedom from authority and oppression. Even Martin Luther, who is the father of the Protestant Revolution, emphasized freedom for the Christian from the spiritual bondage at the hands of the Catholic Church. Because many were, they didn't have the ability to read or write, most of them, and they were somewhat in that jurisdiction of the Catholic Church. And of such, some of the enthusiastic peasants in Germany actually took up arms against their German lords that ruled over them, thinking that they should be free. Today, many advocates of liberation theology have interpreted the message to cross over that we should be socialistic or communistic in ways of overthrowing the oppressive social capitalistic systems and economic equality for all. That's not what Peter's talking about here under slavery. He's talking about respecting the position that you're in. However, the apostles and the early church leaders knew the dangers of pushing for social and political change and upheaval that is apart from the true conversion of the mind and the hearts of believers. You might have heard it says that we cannot legislate morality. And there's truth in that idiom. I mean, I would like to see us be a more Christian nation. But until the hearts and the minds of those legislators and the people, populace in general, change, we won't see a substantial change in our country or anywhere in the world. It is true that the gospel of Jesus Christ penetrates the people's hearts on a broad scale. And that's the only way that culture is transformed. If we want our culture to change, then we as believers need to make sure that we're impacting our culture for Christ. The evils of poverty and slavery, the oppression of the radically will be diminished, be radically diminished if our hearts change and we change the hearts of those that we're acquainted with. But these social changes are a result and not a goal of God's ultimate priority. Yes, I think that God would like to see us free as a country and a nation, but his ultimate goal is to see us free spiritually, that we have spiritual freedom, regardless of the political situation that we're born into. Knowing that the human tendency is to rebel against unfair treatment, and I'm just as guilty as anyone on this, Peter urges his Christian servants to submit to their masters, even those that are rough and unreasonable. Admittedly, this is a hard load to bear. Peter's exhortation to submission makes sense when we connect it with our calling to shine as a reflection of Christ's character in a dark and ungodly world. Peter makes this point clear when he brings it back to Christ's suffering, the unjust for the just. 
In verse 21, it says, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. When we suffer unjustly at the hands of a cruel dictator or an unfair or overbearing boss, we participate in Christ's ministry of unjust suffering on behalf of other people. Christ suffered on behalf of us. We suffer on behalf of other believers as they see our lives manifesting Jesus Christ, the gospel lived out in our everyday lives. And nobody suffered as unjustly as Christ did. He was the only perfect man who ever lived. He was misunderstood by his listeners. He was maligned by his enemies. He was forsaken by his family. He was betrayed by his friends. He was abandoned by his disciples. He was tortured by law enforcers. And he was executed by politicians. The only one in history with every right to complain remained silent. The only man who could ever call on God to judge his enemies, he quietly endured the undeserved judgment in verse 23. And he did all this not for himself, but for us. Verse 24. Dying in our place on that cross, the just for the unjust, he healed our souls that we can live a new life of righteousness. Also in verse 24. So Peter calls his readers and all of us, including all of us, to submit willingly to people in authority, even if they behave unjustly. We don't obey just because they treat us well. We obey because that's the law of the land, or that's the work rules that we must follow. But it doesn't mean make us this call to keep peace, to uphold a worldly system. God's kingdom takes priority over all, any worldly empire. Instead, he points us to Christ as that epic example. Christ entrusted himself to him who judges righteously, so he can endure injustice with hope. Similarly, we entrust ourselves to the shepherd or the guardian of our souls, in verse 25. By following Christ's example, we can be secure and unshakable hope during hurtful times. That brings us to our application today on the other side of your bulletin insert. Application, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 25, is we are to bear the benefits, or bear the benefits of bear, bearing the brunt of unjust treatments. Peter approached to facing unjust treatments from the government authorities and those who dominate us in our work appears somewhat radical. We don't like to hear it. Outright rebellion and overt revenge seems less revolutionary, though, than patiently enduring unjust suffering for the cause of Christ. Not many of us, especially in the United States and our Western nation, will suffer persecution at the hands of government. Still, Christians are becoming part of an increasing pluralistic society that's growing less tolerant toward Christianity. And we face challenges in the political and social institutions involving unfair treatment. And with the rapid deterioration of Christian values in our culture, we might expect unfair treatment, especially in the workplace or just in our social circles. In both cases, our initial response will likely to be to speak out radically to do something overt, but Peter offers us an even more radical way that we should behave. Our world bombards us with a message that urges us to stand up for our personal rights. I'm proud to be an American, and that's the way we feel. But how far do we let that go? When does it cross the line, and when would it be better for us to suffer in order for the cause of Christ. It seems like when somebody steps on our toes, when they cross the line, when they ignore our boundaries, when they intrude on our personal domain, that we can find a lawyer's number quicker than we can find a scripture that tells us how to deal with that. Stop and think. When was the last time you suffered unjustly for the cause of Christ. 
When was the last time you surrendered your right to, to the deliberate purpose of following Christian or Christ's example? How rare it is in our fight back, get even society. And it's not only America, most of the Western world is this way. We're quick to rise up, to stand when we don't really fully understand the implications on the cause of Christ. Now, Peter's message to the fledging first century church can feel like a punch in the gut for us in the 21st century church. And we can't downplay the significance of his call to patiently endure intolerance, prejudice, and unjust treatments for being a follower of Christ. And because this attitude doesn't flow from us naturally, we need to take some time to approach this unfair treatment by answering some two following questions, and I have these in your bulletin insert. The first question is, consider which natural reaction to unfair treatment generally characterizes your own. Do you instantly strike back? Do you look for opportunities for revenge? In your experience, what have been the adverse effects of the responses that you have taken? How might unbelievers perceive Christians and Christianity because of your reactions? And second reflection point is, reflecting on Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42, which I'll read here in a second, how does Christ's teaching apply to everyday situations in life? How might unbelievers perceive Christians and Christianity if you live the radical response of harsh treatments and be willing to be unjustly treated as Peter proposes here? In teaching about revenge, Christ tells us to consider a tolerant response. Again, in Matthew 5, 38 through 42, he says, You have heard the law that says, The punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist evil, an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If your soldier demands you that you carry his gear a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask, and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Now we might enjoy the rush of personal gratification that we stand up for ourselves and exact revenge against those who are in authority over us, but Christ calls us for a better way. Instead of meeting the world slap on the face with a punch in the gut, Christ tells us Let's consider a more tolerant response. How can I show Christ in my life through my responses? We must never let the world's sense of right and wrong determine our own sense of right and wrong. We must submit to the lordship of the perfect leader who sets the example for surrendering personal rights for God's greater glory. And that's what Peter wants to get across in this passage today. It's hard. It was hard for me as I studied through this this week. We like to stand up for our rights. We see so much injustice in the world, and we say, well, we need to stop that. We need to get back to the Lord. But until the hearts and the lives of people are changed, our nation will never change. And that's our responsibility as Christians, to show forth the love of Christ to everyone. And that might mean suffering unjustly as an example that Christ gives, uh, gives us in the scripture. Now next week, we continue on a similar theme, but in the second section of the letter of 1 Peter of our strange life, it's going to be a message of the give and take of domestic harmony. It's one thing to get along with those outside your family, but what about your spouse or your children or those that are closest to you? How do we have harmony within that relationship? That's the true test of, of our willingness to live a life like Christ. So I'd encourage you to read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your love, your goodness, your mercy to us. We thank you for this message, although it's hard for us to hear, especially in our country where we're independent on so many things, Father. For the blessings that you've poured out on our country, we give to realize they come from you, Father. Help us as believers to be willing to suffer if it comes to it, Father, for the cause of Christ.
that more might come to know you, that their hearts and their minds might be changed. That's the only way we'll see true change in our country and the world, Father, by the changing of individual hearts and lives and minds. Let us be an element, a tool that you use. In order I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly... I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward. Enjoy your journey and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.